Hello and welcome to the fifth unit of the history and practice of multimedia. Our topic for today is audiovisual performance. And before I jump in, I would like to offer a quick overview of the lecture. I'll start with briefly unpacking the terms audiovisual and performance to give a context for their use in my discussion. Then we will look at some examples of audiovisual performances, after which I will go over a few important genres in uh, the lineage of audiovisual art. Following that, I will switch to a theoretical discussion of sound image relationships, and at the end, I will propose a new subgenre of audiovisual performance that I call video music performance. But first, I want to share a few of my early experiences with audiovisual performance that, looking back now, probably set me off on this path of uh, dedicating my compositional practice, research, and teaching to audiovisual art forms. Sometime around 2004, I went to a live audiovisual show by the duo Hextatic. Um, while I had attended other shows with live visuals before, this group really made me feel like I was seeing a live music video that was carefully constructed but unfolding in real time and with an even more powerful rhythmic structure than a music video that Im was emerging from simultaneity of the live music and the live visual manipulation. This was a piece that Georg Haidu actually brought to class when I was studying multimedia composition in Hamburg, and uh, I was immediately taken away by its audiovisual composition craft. The work was originally composed and presented at the Sonic Arts Research Center in Belfast, UK, for their Sonic Laboratory concert space, which boasts a sphere of 48 speakers around, above, and below the audience. And we recently revived this work for a concert at Karma in our space that's equipped with a similar setup, a dome of 56.8 speakers. And uh, experiencing this piece in that manner only confirmed my impression that I had when watching it on a small screen and listening to the binaural rendition. And that's the fact that in this work, I feel like the audiovisual elements are the performers. In 2011, I attended a performance when I was still at uh, HFMT Hamburg. I believe it was when uh, Michel van der Rahe, uh, the composer, was uh, there in the residency. And what struck me in this performance were these seemingly direct but clearly non-interactive connections between the performer on stage and the performer in the film, as well as between the live music on stage and the pre-recorded soundtrack of the film all doing their part in uh, the compositional structure.
Now that I've shown you a few of my uh, early influences, uh, I'd like to move to the term audiovisual. And uh, I want to share this quote by Max Matthews, who was a renowned pioneer in computer music, because it directly touches upon an apparent weakness in the intersection of the arts, or of media for that matter. He said, I personally find most combined music video are problematic. It seems to me that the sound and images often compete for my attention. If I pay attention to what I'm seeing, I often miss what I'm hearing. And if I try to concentrate on the music, the images can often be an irritating distraction. So it's interesting to pose this issue in contrast to, uh, let's call them real world audiovisual phenomena. Uh, since our perception is multimodal and it's only natural to experience the world around us through both sight and hearing. Of course, in the art, the disciplines have long been separated, and even though there is a rich history of them coming together, especially since the dawn of the 20th century, there are still many theories and debates today about what constitutes valuable, successful interactions between sounds and images. So going back to Max Mattis's viewpoint, uh, the idea that sounds and images somehow compete for the audience's attention is actually crucial. As we'll see through a few different theoretical frameworks of uh, audiovisual analysis, uh, it's precisely this perceived competition, or sometimes the lack thereof, that allows sounds and images, music and video, to combine into something that's more than the sum of its parts. Let's now turn our attention to the term performance. Performance indicates, on the one hand, the involvement of one or more persons or other entities with agency that present a work to an audience. On the other hand, the concept of performance signals that the work takes place in real time. And I'd like to stress this latter point. While we can discuss performance from many perspectives in different disciplines, music, theater, performance art, and other forms of entertainment, I think the question of liveness is important for our topic. That aspect of performance which can grant an audiovisual artwork the state of presence. The question of uh, liveness in multimedia or audiovisual performance is particularly interesting because of the involvement of technologies that have been long associated with processes of recording and reproduction. The debate on what constitutes liveness in performance is often attributed to two opposing theoretical views. On one side is Peggy Phelan's 1993 book, Unmarked, The Politics of Performance, which advocates for the ontological irreproducibility and ephemerality of performance. On the other side, Philip Auslander's writings in his 1999 book, Liveness, Performance in a Mediatized Culture, problematizes the concept of live performance in the context of mediatized events, asserting that there is in fact no clear, uh, and I quote, ontological distinction between live forms and mediatized one, end quote. And he underlines that the concept of live performance has appeared as a consequence of the ability to record and broadcast performances using technology. In the chapter called The Ontology of Performance, Representation Without Reproduction, Peggy Fallon postulates that performance's life is in the present. Performance cannot be saved, recorded, documented, or otherwise participate in the circulation of representations of representations. Once it does so, it becomes something other than performance. She adds that performance implicates the real through the presence of living bodies, positioning her theory in relation to contemporary performance art. This is a crucial point that I will borrow and use later in my lecture. Philip Auslander argues that live performance today has become almost indistinguishable from its mediatized counterpart. The word mediatized, which he borrowed from philosopher Jean Baudrillard, refers to events that are disseminated via mass, mass media, uh, such as television, audio or video recordings, and other reproduction technologies, such as live streaming, uh, the internet, and so on. Auslander writes that live performance now often incorporates mediatization, such that the live event itself is a product of media technologies. This has been the case to some degree for a long time, of course. As soon as electric amplification is used, one might say that an event is mediatized. What we actually hear is the vibration of a speaker, or a production by technological means of a sound, picked up by a microphone, 
not the original live acoustic event. Recently, however, this effect has been intensified across a very wide range of performance genres and cultural contexts, from the giant television screens at sports arenas to the video app apparatus used in uh, much performance art. Rosemary Klisch and uh, Edward Shear also point out in their book Multimedia Performance that it is not the distinctiveness of the different elements, such as live versus mediatized, that matters. Rather, it is the real-time interaction and experience of these elements that is key. And this interaction constitutes a live experience of performance, which, however mediatized and pre-recorded, may never be exactly reproducible. This uh, reconciliatory view of performance uh, that involves media elements is also the one that I subscribe to, and it will become more apparent throughout this lecture. Stephen Dixon, in his book, Digital Performance, expands on this topic and in relation to live multimedia theater, he writes that the audience's mode of perception of live actors versus film or video projections is different and it becomes noticeable once the live performers leave the stage, leaving the projections in an obvious non-live state. And I'd like to provide two quick examples of this. While the video performer is of a different nature than those live performers on stage, even with a different size and background, we perceive them as a group, and the question of live versus pre-produced video is less relevant. Once the live performers disappear from the stage and we are left with the video, it suddenly changes our perception of the nature of the pre-recorded performer. Applause. In another example by Michael Bail, the piece Blackjack, here, uh, again, the live and virtual performers seem to be merged into the same frame due to the video feedback effects. But the interplay between live action, live recording, immediate and delayed playback alters how we see the liveness of each layer. So now that we briefly covered the two constituent terms of this lecture, let's take a look and listen to a few excerpts from contrasting works that fall under this umbrella of audiovisual performance. feet apart and your arms raised.
As you can observe, the manifestations of audiovisual performance can vary quite radically in form, aesthetics, technology, and presentation. So before going forward and talking about current practices associated with audiovisual performance and this new subgenre that I'm proposing, it's worth taking a look back at how we got here in the first place. What is the historical lineage of audiovisual art? We'll take a tour through some of the most relevant audiovisual forms of the past, and I will also share a few theoretical frameworks that will aid the analysis of audiovisual performance works. Early audiovisual correspondences can be traced back to the ancient Greeks, but it was in the 18th century when Isaac Newton proposed relationships between the wave properties of light, color, and those of sound, pitch, and music. Others followed suit for the next two centuries and mapped musical tones to colors, some of them also creating these contraptions to achieve the correlation between light and sound named color organs. These were instruments based on light in various shapes and sizes, often modeled after the harpsichord, with the purpose of realizing direct conversions from music to color light projections. Alexander Scriabin included such a device uh, called clavier la lumière, keyboard with lights, in his score for the symphonic word Prometheus. Preston Miller then created the chromola, a color organ, to perform that part, although its appearance in performances was uh, rarely documented. But you can see here photographs from a recent recreation by Anna Gabo at Yale School of Music. Next, uh, visual music is perhaps the ancestor of all audiovisual art practices today. Even before and outside the technologies uh, like film, video, and digital media, Visual music existed through intersections between music and the visual arts. Painters like Vasily Kandinsky, Piet Mondrian, Jackson Pollock, or Mark Lotko sought to transfer musical parameters, rhythm, form, and texture into their visual language. But what we mostly refer to as visual music today began as a form of early film, namely abstract or absolute film. This was a departure from traditional narrative cinema, being concerned with structure and form rather than tangible objects or meanings. The idea was similar to what the aforementioned painters had attempted, to transpose musical structures and behaviors into moving images. In essence, these were audiovisual works in which the visual and musical layers were coordinated as a single entity. Some of the first uh, visual music works consisted of non-figurative and geometric shapes moving in rhythmical patterns. Later, abstract shapes started being choreographed through classical music and other types of music. So the three main historical categories of visual music are uh, non-moving visual music, such as uh, certain paintings, uh, visual music, so silent film, uh, image without sound, and audiovisual music, uh, image with sound. Let's take a look at a couple examples.
and another one. I should also mention that these are all very short excerpts from, from all the pieces I'm sharing. And sometimes I jump through, through the piece just to show different things. So as you could observe, there is almost always a very direct uh, kind of one-to-one -one rhythmic correspondence between the visuals and the music. This is related, although not equal, to synesthesia or joint perception something that we can't ignore when talking about visual music. Synesthesia is a rare but real condition in which one sense, like hearing, concurrently triggers another sense, such as sight. People with synesthesia might, might uh, smell something when they hear a sound or see a shape when they eat a certain food. Kandinsky literally saw colors when he heard music and heard music when he painted. So visual music is linked to synesthesia in its attempt to either recreate the types of cross-model uh, connections between sight and hearing that uh, are experienced by some synesthetic artists, or to design what psychologists Johnny Harrison and Simon Baron Cohen called pseudo-synesthesia as an immersive effect. Amy Mulligan in the visual music film describes the metaphor as pseudo-synesthesia. Audiovisual relationship is uh, functioning not as a direct translation of sound into image, but as an allegory of correspondence. And she gives Norman McLaren as an example, who was purportedly, purportedly uh, synesthet, and uh, noted that, I quote, the color sound association he uses are pseudo culturally synesthetic associations, end quote. Mulligan then calls synesthesia a sort of quote, popular malapropism in relation to the visual music film, end quote. Since generally the audiovisual correspondences are artificial, constructed, and meant to evoke the feeling of synesthesia. Nevertheless, this type of one-to-one -one synesthesia-like correspondence is perhaps the most recognizable feature of not only visual music, but audiovisual genres in general. In some works, especially early visual music, as we saw in some of the examples, it pervades the entire structure as the single or the most important process of audiovisual unfolding. While uh, there is no film or video in this uh, next piece that I will show, uh, the visual movement is uh, fully realized by the performers, while the added elements of lighting design uh, create a sense of um, counterpoint. So what we see is a complex contrapuntal visual music in which the parts are scored for a plethora of bodily gestures and actions. Some of these also generate sounds due to the interaction between body parts, between bodies and objects like chairs and floor, or even subtle vocalization uh, caused by uh, some of the actions. Another art form that has been influential in present day audiovisual performance is uh, video art. Although the video medium is a technology that was popularized only 50 years ago, it has already traveled a long journey in the arts. Video art was born in the 1960s at the intersection of television and fluxus. It swiftly reached its pinnacle by the 1980s and settled as an established genre in the 1990s, once with its institutional acceptance. Nowadays, the, the genre is rather theorized and historicized than practiced because of the obsolescence of the original analog medium. 
but the principles of video art have been uh, have spread and evolved into various audiovisual genres, which is why it's useful to look at some of its characteristics. First, video art has been an audiovisual genre from the start. Musicologist Holly Rogers shows that before video's arrival, early audiovisual practices such as lantern shows, music theater, opera, synesthetic experimentation, early direct film, and so on, were intermedial primarily at the level of reception. Uh, but video made it possible to achieve audiovisuality at the level of production, thanks to the medium's abilities to record sounds and images simultaneously. Rogers says, uh, quote, with the new medium, artists were able to include sound in their work in order to push the boundaries of current creative concerns. But video also presented composers with the opportunity to visualize their music, end quote. So many pioneers of video art were in fact musicians like Namjoon Paik, Taino Vasulka, Robert Cayenne, Tony Conrad, Bill Viola. And this established the practice as a highly musical genre in Holly Rogers' words. Bill Viola explains too how video is a closer relative to sound than to film because the camera, which is an electronic transducer, transforms physical energy into electrical impulses comparable to a microphone, whereas film relies on a mechanical and chemical process. Therefore, video developed as a close relative to audio technology and its editing techniques. Video offered artists a platform for experimentation that was unhindered by the conventions and traditions of fine art. For this reason, many women took to the opportunity to express their work through video. Michael Z. Newman, in his book Video Revolutions, explains that between the 1950s and the 1990s, before digital video was commercialized, the medium moved away from its original correlation uh, with television and became a sort of opposition to it and to its live broadcasting nature. Uh, the writer shows that video in its infancy was perceived as a revolutionary solution to many of the perceived problems of television. Lastly, the concept of performance was paramount in video art. As uh, Helen Veskist clarifies, video was used in the 1970s as recordings in performances and as recordings of performances, both of which were referred to as video performances. In the former category belong works by Carole Schneemann or Dan Graham, which integrated the immediacy and intimacy of the video medium into live performance. Vito Conci and John Jonas fit into the latter category, uh, which transcended live bodily performances into video recordings for the purpose of further manipulation. This way, the performance conceded its physical liveness to a virtual version. Both these types of performance-based video art have remained influential in the works of media artists and audiovisual composers today. Historically, concurrent with the development of video art, the medium of uh, video was used to establish another audiovisual genre, which delivered content to a wider audience and is very much alive today, music video. And just to warn you, the following slide includes some flashing imagery in case you have any sensitivity with that. So what I find compelling in music video is, as Carol Vernalis puts it, the remediation of visual material by combining, juxtaposing, or appropriating imagery from different sources in a manner similar to how poetry relies on figurative language. Matthias von de Korksgaard wrote that music videos both visualize music and musicalize vision, which is a type of symbiotic relationship between music and video that I will come back to later. Furthermore, Michel Chion wrote that music's power to displace time and space is taken a step further in music video, where only sporadic sync points are necessary to keep the audiovisual medium together, but the image is allowed to wander at will through time and space. This sense of autonomous audiovisual layers that come together at only necessary sync points is different from what visual music proposed. Instead of an almost continuous audiovisual correspondence, the music and the moving image act as quasi-independent entities here. Obviously, this will be different from one music video to another, depending on their visual content, which can be generally assigned to one of these three main categories. Uh, videos that portray the music performance, videos that present an independent narrative from the music, 
and videos that exhibit a specific concept such as dance, travel, abstract imagery, and so on. While visual music, video art, and music video have had different aesthetic, cultural, and socioeconomic starting points and features, there are many overlaps in terms of how they treat mu uh, music and moving image as partners in a joint artistic endeavor. So in the following part of the lecture, we will look at a few theoretical frameworks that provide insights into how sounds and images work together in these art forms and other audiovisual manifestations. First, the concepts of parallelism and counterpoint. Sergei Eisenstein, a pioneering director and film theorist, proposed that sound montage be developed along the lines of a visual montage and that the two be asynchronous to one another. Uh, parallel here basically means doing the same thing, which is crucial for uh, dialogue and sound effects going along with the image in precise sync but not desirable for music as it is seen as an aesthetic doubling. On the other hand, counterpoint creates a fruitful disjunction between what is seen and what is heard. And we know from music that counterpoint is this independence of musical voices or lines that nevertheless make sense together. But in music, there are different types of motion in counterpoint, parallel, contrary, and oblique. In film music counterpoint, only the contrary motion is considered. Michel Sion then is dissatisfied with the notion of audiovisual counterpoint and prefers to call it audiovisual dissonance. He finds that beyond the issue of quasi misappropriation of the musical term counterpoint, the problem is that in film, sounds are considered based on their stereotype meaning rather than intrinsic sonic qualities. And he gives an example from Jean Luc Godard's film uh, First Name Carmen that opens uh, with a uh, metro shot in Paris and the sound of a seagull cries. Um, he calls to the fact that critics interpreted this as counterpoint, so an urban setting of the metro with uh, the seashore um, alluded by the seagulls, when in fact the sound itself, uh, stripped from its meaning, may not have created an opposition to the image. So let's see two examples of uh, what we might find what we might fit under these two paradigms of parallelism and counterpoint. This, of course, corresponds to the idea of parallelism between sound and image. And this is what we could call counterpoint between the film and the sounds, the music. Chion's theories of sound image relationship primarily address film, but they are so well thought out and generalizable that they can easily be transported to other genres. Uh, the first chapter in his book, Audiovisual Sound on Screen, uh, called Audiovisual Contract, is based on the audiovisual illusion that he calls added value. He says that sound shows us the image differently than what the image shows alone. And the image likewise makes us hear sound differently than if the sound were ringing out in the dark. So the concept posited by Xion is that when combined, the effect of the two elements together, sound and image, is more powerful and expressive than either could be standing on its own. Key to understanding Xion's argument is his theory of reciprocity between sound and image. One cannot act upon the other without being changed itself. Therefore, sound in film reaches its full potential only through the lenses of added value. The other major concept from his book that I want to mention here is that of the synchrosis. 
Xion coined this uh, concept in reference to the spontaneous and irresistible world produced between a particular auditory phenomenon and visual phenomenon when they occur at the same time. He explains that synchrosis occurs independently of any rational logic, so as a law of audiovisual gestalt, but he also calls it Pavlovian because it is conditioned by the creator of the synchronized event. Furthermore, the theorist underlines that synchrosis is not necessarily always rhythmic in nature, but it can also rely on meaning, which is dependent on cultural habits. To understand this, let's consider the correspondence to the natural world. For example, we see and hear simultaneously a balloon popping. This is, of course, an illusion since our eyes and ears perceive the event asynchronously, but the delay between them is so small, a matter of milliseconds, that our brains bind the two occurrences into one experience. However, unlike the natural world, the audiovisual composer has the liberty of misplacing or associating sounds and images, and since our brains are used to merge oral and visual events, they make sense through synchrosis. Obviously, in an artwork, this relies in part on our suspension of disbelief, because we realize that the amalgamation of dissimilar sounds and images is an artistic construct. Let's take a look at an example of synchrosis. In analyzing musical multimedia, Nicholas Cooks looks at multimedia as cooperation between semantically charged communication channels, underlining the role of music in audiovisual meaning making. He proposes an analysis framework for cross model relationships based on correspondences between the media, or what he calls instances of multimedia. Considering each medium's meaning in relationship to another and arguing that a new meaning arises when layers work together, so an emergent meaning, Cook defines three metaphor-based models of multimedia. And just by looking at Cook's diagram is perhaps not immediately clear, but uh, to reach one of these uh, relationships, one has to put the media, in our case, the audiovisual layers, to a test. First is the similarity test. Are the meanings of the music and the visuals consistent? If yes, then they exhibit conformance. If not, they are still coherent since they are presented together, so another test of difference is required. Are the meanings contrary or contradictory? This results in the complementation and contest models. Let's consider an example for each model. As a last theoretical point, I turn to Andrew Knight Hill's concept of audiovisual space. He is dissatisfied with the audiovisual theories based on temporal links, as they cannot fully explain the richness of an audiovisual experience. 
In his 2020 article, he proposes a reconceptualization of sound image relationships as complementary dimensions of a unified audiovisual space. He talks about a perceptual space, so not a panoramic space as in surround sound. Uh, this is a virtual space constructed in the audience's uh, mind, in, um, which replaces our normal visual field. So it's a phenomenological space. The immersion in the audiovisual space of the work occurs similarly to cinema through transcending the physical space and entering the space of the experience. His argument thus relies on special concepts and metaphors. Nightheel suggests that temporal constructs may be viewed rather as changes in space through movement, and that expression can be found within trajectories constructed by spatial transitions. Gesture is then an externalized trajectory, while texture is an internalized flux, both being dispositions of energy in space. He says that audiovisual space is constructed through the articulation of sound and image materials, a dynamic flux of energies unfolding through time. The reality of perceived space is a result of these materials and their articulation. The reason I brought uh, this paradigm to the table is that I appreciate Night Seal's attempt to move beyond the analysis of separate consequent points in time and to consider overarching structures that form these audiovisual spaces. However, I believe that within those spaces, the dimension of time is not eradicated and we can still apply the previous temporal analysis tools in parallel or in addition to the idea of a common conceptual space. Hopefully, this incursion into the theoretical frameworks of audiovisual relationship gives a clear image of both the historical genres I presented previously and the following examples. Let's take a quick look as a, at an example of audiovisual space. Let's come back to the um, term audiovisual performance. Uh, at this point, I will actually pivot and will stop referring to this umbrella term of audiovisual performance. Instead, I propose a new term to designate a genre based on the practices I observed in works by composers who implement video and music performance. In my own composition, I've devoted the past 13 years or so to creating audiovisual relationships in what I call, for lack of a better term, video music performance. In my own compositional practice, as well as based on my research in the field, I felt the need to narrow down the field of audiovisual performance, which otherwise includes a plethora of practices such as VJ culture, interactive visuals and electronic music, light shows, laser shows, projection mapping with music performance, silent films with live music, etc., etc., etc. Uh, so analyzing other composer works uh, with video during my doctorate, I started noticing common threads between them and also with my own work. In the following, I will expose my proposal for delineating this genre of video music performance. Honestly, I don't think it's a very catchy term or even easy to pronounce. And in fact, because I will have to mention it very often in the following minutes, I will just abbreviate it to VMP from video music performance, so that it's just easier to uh, address it. And as you can see, I decided to simply prepend the word video to the already established discipline of music performance in order to show the integration of this medium into the traditions, conventions, practices of music performance. I assert that music vi uh, video music performance lives, uh, lives at the intersection of music performance, composed theater, film and visual music, video art, and music video. And it inherits elements from all these art forms in various degrees. As a subgenre of audiovisual performance, it continues the lineage of practices that combine sounds and image. As such, it's preceded and informed by over a century of similar endeavors, as we've seen earlier. From color organs, to avant-garde experiments of abstract filmmakers, to revolutionary video artists, 
uh, computerized visual music and to internet and digitality. But its main distinction from other audiovisual art forms uh, are the centrality of live performance and the influence of the field of new music. When composers work with video and performance, they most often bring their musical background into the process as the primary way of structuring audiovisual relationships, as well as relationships between performers and electronic media. The way I look at these structural elements are through a concept that I call symbiotic interrelations. These are the interactions that occur as a consequence of the performers, the electronic medium of video and acoustic or electronic music inhabiting the same time and space of a performance. As we know from biology, different types of organisms can live together in a close and usually long-term interaction called symbiosis, which is mutually beneficial. This partnership between performers, video and music should be understood and analyzed in the context of a specific work and its overall concept and structure. So the main convention I set for demarcating this genre is that the interconnections between music, video, and performer should be observable in all three stages of a work, conception, production, and reception. And I'd like to give a couple counterexamples that clarify what I mean by this. An old opera, played by Mozart, that employs video projections, lacks the conceptual integration of the layers at the moment of conception. The interrelations that emerge between the music and the video projections, for example, were obviously not considered by the composer. And while also not completely coincidental, uh, since some other artist has created in this in response to the music, the added projections are closer to something of a music video that is created after the music is already completed. That's why I consider something like this to be outside of the scope of the genre. Uh, during the real-time presentation on stage, together with human performers, video, whether it's pre-produced or live, showcases what Paul Sandon calls temporal liveness and spatial liveness, and becomes a living part of the performance. So I don't really have any counterexample here, as long as performers are aware of their relationship to the video and to the music that they don't perform themselves, this condition is already met. For the final stage of reception, if one of the layers of the triumvirate is not visible or audible, then I consider that the work is not a video music performance. For example, a composition that is based on a video score, which the audience cannot see, falls out of this genre for the absence of performer video relationships in the spectator's perception. What you can see here is on the bottom right corner is the actual live performance. And the other three videos are uh, video scores that the performers look at in order to perform. But the audience doesn't see those videos. They only see the performers playing their acoustic instruments. So we are missing this performer video relationship in the spectator's perception. Furthermore, even if all the elements are there, video, music, performer, it doesn't necessarily mean that the work engages these entities in sufficient meaningful relationships to stay within the border of this genre. And I'd like you to take a quick look and listen to this example by Yoji Ikeda. Uh, again, this is very flashy in case you have any sensitivity. So here we are missing something that Caleb Stewart describes as the body of the musician directly and causally in a one-to-one -one relationship, acting on an object physically to create a sound. Or in other words, there is a lack of embodied virtuosity. And I make this distinction precisely to avoid the overlap with many other audiovisual performance manifestations where the performer is simply pushing buttons and turning knobs or faders. So in order to become relevant to this proposed genre, a work should check one or, one or more of the following conditions. Uh, the work is intended for and performed by classically trained musicians or performance artists, uh, or parts of the music are written for acoustic and or electronic music instruments, non-conventional instruments or singers. Um, 
elements of virtuosity of the performance on stage are noticeable. And uh, the work exhibits elements of composition, structure, or conceptual underpinnings that relate the performer's bodies and personas to the audiovisual narrative. So there's a perceived spatial, temporal, or metaphorical interrelation between the performer and the audiovisual media. Since video, let's call it, is the added element to music performance, I will dedicate the following part to its implementation in VMP. The embodiment of video on stage happens usually through a projector and the projection screen. Levmanovich provides a useful definition of the screen. The visual culture of the modern period from painting to cinema is characterized by an intriguing phenomenon. The existence of another virtual space, another three-dimensional world enclosed by a frame and situated inside our normal space. The frame separates two absolutely different spaces that somehow coexist. Thus, the frame of the screen hosts a virtual world on the stage along with the music performers. And I want to propose here three ways of describing the presence, integration, and significance of a video screen on stage. Each of them alters the perception of the music performers in different ways. It is common for two or all three meanings of the screen to be present in a piece. My categorization is based on what Vivian Sobchak described as the three metaphors that have dominated film theory. The picture frame, the window, and the mirror. The picture frame refers to formalist theories that consider the frame a synthetic space and insist on the artificial elements of cinema. In contrast, the window um, metaphor is linked to realist theories, which advocate an honest representation of reality. And the screen as mirror signifies the spectator's identification not only with the characters in the film, but also with the apparatus of cinema, camera, projector, and screen, which ultimately leads to the identification with the self. But my usage of these terms in the following categorization does not attempt to retain the strict original sense of the metaphors. Rather, it adjusts them as necessary for the practices of VMP. So first, screen as picture frame um, can recontextualize the music performance. Let's take a look at the examples. That's going to happen. And this is going to happen. So the video displayed on screen provides clarification or adds external meanings to the music performance. Next, screen as window can virtually augment the stage and the performance. You can see here the conductor peering through the window of the screen. Lastly, screen as mirror uh, reflects the performance on stage. And among the words that I've uh, studied, this is the most widespread and effective solution for the video integration. Uh, this reflection that is literal or figurative of music performance or any aspect of it onto the screen. This 
Metaphor of the mirror is so prevalent in VMP that it deserves special attention. There are in fact so many pieces with mirror performers that I'm almost tempted to suggest that a sub subgenre of video music performance is necessary. Perhaps I could call it meta, meta video music performance. To aid my categorization, I turn to French philosopher Jean Baudrillard and his book Simulations and Simulacra, in which he examines relationships between reality, symbols, and society, claiming that our current society has replaced all reality and meanings with symbols and signs, and that human experience is a simulation of reality. However, I have to admit that um, this is going to be a very speculative approach, just like uh, with the metaphors of the screen. So Baudrillard distinguishes four levels of an image as simulation of reality. The first is a reflection of a profound reality. So this could be, for example, a photograph. The second is that it masks and denatures a profound reality. So an example would be a photograph that's been manipulated in Photoshop, for example. The third level is that it masks the absence of a profound reality. This could be a photograph that has been created digitally to simulate reality, so a hyper reality. And the fourth level of uh, the image is that it has no relation to any reality whatsoever. It is its own pure simulacrum. So this would be a digital image that has no correspondence in nature. If we switch to sound examples, uh, we could um, say that the first level uh, could be a raw recording of an instrument, of an acoustic instrument, uh, whereas the second level would be an edited, an enhanced recording of an instrument. The third level could be a recording of a digitally simulated instrument. And the fourth level of the simulacrum would be a recording of a synthesizer that doesn't sound like any acoustic instrument that we know. For the purpose of looking at the screen as mirrors on stage, I make the following proposition. The first level are called clones. So these are faithful copies of the performers on stage. The second level are doppelgangers, unfaithful copies who alter the meaning of the originals. Third level is avatars, virtual representations that appear to copy reality, but they're not actually molded from the original performers. And the fourth level are symbolic representations which appear to mirror or mimic some features of the performance. So let's take um, a look at um, two examples from each category. As I mentioned, there are so many great pieces that I, I had to um, choose two for, for each of these categories. So let's look at some clones.
we are at the avatars categorization now. You can see uh, an actual avatar from the game Second Life in the projection. That seems to match the singer on stage. And finally, symbols. see here also a direct mirroring of the performer's movement. And another example. Huh. So yeah, once we've done it, we are free. And recognize too that consists of taking care about your contact. Your friends on Facebook can become your lover or even your boss. So it's convenient factor and make the rest believe and success. So, like, 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 like the life of the people you didn't remove in one. You decide the pieces of your puzzle. So, be happy when they are happy and sad when they are sad. Now that I've established the integration of the video's body on stage, I'd like to go back to the diagram of interrelations and define a few categories that will lead me to describing the interaction with video on stage. So, these are uh, direct and indirect. Uh, connections. Uh, some examples of uh, direct connections would be that the video has a soundtrack, or that a performer plays an acoustic instrument, or a performer controls the video and responds to it. On the other hand, indirect examples would be musical events that are associated artificially with video, audio effects that seem to respond to performer or vice versa when in fact they're not, or the video appears to be manipulated by the performer or vice versa, and again, it is not. I'm going to focus on the video performer relationships. So as direct connections, we can observe uh, reactive and interactive elements. And I have to mention that real interactivity between musician and the video requires a process of mutual influence, uh, which rarely happens in strict sense in DMP. Instead, we as audience experience either some type of reactivity between musician and video or a fabricated interactivity um, crafted by the composer and enacted by the performer and the video. So this would fall under the categories of illusory or metaphorical connections. So let's see a few examples here as well. Um, some uh, reactive connections where the performer is uh, influencing the video or is um, somehow appearing in the video directly. So in this piece, the performers, each performer has a smartphone in their hand and they transmit. Um, a specific video to, to the projection and here we have a 360 camera that rotates and looks around the performers seeing both the live performance as well as um, 3D models that act as a sort of um, doppelgangers. Other reactive connections, uh, the other way around, where the video is somehow influencing the performer, 
would be a video score. For interactive connections, I have this example by Stefan Prince, where the performers are controlling other performers in projections with the help of um, game controllers. For the illusory type, uh, the attempt is to convince the audience of a link between performer and video, either through the video itself or through the music. Take a look at an example by Nicole Lizé. <laughs> While the video and the performance seem to be directly connected, they are in fact not reacting to each other, but following the same score, so to speak. For the last category of metaphorical connections, I turn again to one of my own pieces. Fiecare subiect uman va fi instruit să efectueze mișcări instinctive ale brațelor, ca răspuns la o serie de structuri sonore generate algoritmic în laboratorul nostru. Gebocaris va prelua așadar nu numai datele despre mișcările subiectilor, ci și corelația cu stările lor psihologice din acele momente și va face apoi o simulare completă a undelor de creier. <coughs> All right, as I get to the end of my presentation, I want to pose a question in relation to our pandemic times. What happens when video music performance cannot take place on a stage in front of an audience anymore? Many musicians have fled to online performance formats in the past year while on lockdowns. The screen then swallows the entire visual aspect of the performance and the music is fully mediatized. How about the liveness? This past year we have seen pre-recorded and live stream performances from artists' homes, as well as documentation of performances or live streams with artists physically present in empty venues. The audience tunes in from home. How does this alter the interrelations between video, music, and performers? In some ways, not much. If a performance is simply attempting to replicate what would have taken place on a stage in front of an audience, then it is possible to transfer most of it from the frame of the stage to the frame of the screen, and from the acoustic space, uh, sonic space, to the reproduced one by speakers and headphones. However, over the past year of lockdowns, composers and performers have also experimented with the idiosyncrasies of the online medium while staying close to the traditional notions of physical performance. I'd like to give you an example by Ensemble Thing and Why. I was like, why are you guys all so close to one another? Why A piece that was developed and performed in Zoom. And as you can see, one important peculiarity of, let's call it virtual, VMP is that live performers are already virtual, so the merging with other pre-recorded virtual performers and digital entities becomes possible. Ha! I remember the brown body, younger, thinner, smarter, more open-minded people than I ever was, but especially likable. I was very large. Very chubby, very tall, long hair. 
And I'd also like to give an example from one of my own works, which uh, wasn't really created specifically uh, during the lockdown, but it has been modified to be uh, adapted for it. I'm going to switch very quickly here to my other computer, just because this piece is here and I cannot move it. But hopefully you can still see and hear. Yeah, in here. Can't really hear anything. Okay, let me try to share screen again. Make sure that I've, yeah, first sound is on. Again. Thank you. 
Thank you.